Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. I'm going to tell you something about Perl I.O. Um, Perl I.O. was a new feature in Perl 5.8, which, which for most people is ages ago. Um, it was quite essential for entering the Unicode era. Um, I'll explain that in a moment. But first, uh, Perl I.O. was mainly designed by Nick Ng Simons. Um, you may have heard of him from other projects. He's best known for, for creating TK. He also wrote ENCODE. Um, he did a lot of other things in the community. Uh, however, sadly, uh, he died uh, eight years ago, um, which kind of left Pearl I.O. a bit orphaned. Um, so yes, Unicode. Perl 5.6 was marketing compatible with Unicode. I mean, it, in theory, it had support of it. It just didn't have the utilities to do anything useful with it. Um, and basically, in the release announcement, it has, has this blah, blah that boils down to, we know we needed to have this feature, but we haven't written it yet. So we're going to do that in the future. And that feature later pretty much became Perl IO. Um, Unicode, doing Unicode I.O. in Perl 5.6 involved trickery like this, apparently. I had, I had a hard time finding out how did they do this, but apparently this works. Uh, whereas in Perl 5.6, you just say it's UTF-8, and then you continue as you would have normally have done. Um, yes, Perl I.O. To understand Perl I.O., you have to understand this is a stack. Um, ordinarily, you're only interacting with the topmost stack, and the topmost stack is interacting with the, the layer below it, and that one is interacting with the layer below it, and until you hit, until you hit the base layer, which should be the, the, the low, lowest most layer. Um, uh, the, usually, the base layer is Unix. Unix is essentially implementing standard Unix I.O. This is very, very similar to the semantics that you may be familiar with from uh, sysread and syswrite. Um, um, this is actually the layer that's doing the real work, the actual I.O. Then, for Windows, there is uh, a Win32 layer that absolutely no one is using because it's broken and wrong. Um, me and, is Boke88 here? Not here. Ah. Me and him have been trying to patch it up to actually, uh, to actually work, but we're not entirely there yet. In theory, that would be nice. In practice, Unix is working well enough on Windows that literally everyone is using the Unix layer. Um, on top, those are the base layers. On top of that, there's buffering. Now with buffering, you have to understand why it's useful and why it's sometimes not useful. Um, it's mainly useful for line-based I.O. or actually anything where you don't know in advance how exactly how much you want to read, which also includes encoding stuff, translating stuff, um, various other things. The only thing it's not useful for is actually doing like bulk binary-based I.O. because it's overhead essentially for such purposes. It's just extra copying data. Um, to give you an example why buffering is useful, this is a, na this is a naive, naive implementation of a read line when you do not have buffering. Um, what it essentially does is, does the buffer contain the new line string? If not, read another character and check again. Does the buffer contain end with the new line string? And continue, 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 continue until you're there. Now, a smarter read line um, is something like this. You fill the buffer, then you check in the buffer, is there something that, and is, is there the new, is the new line character in the buffer? Um, if so, read until that point. If not, read the entire buffer, fill it again, try again. Uh, actually, there is a bug in here. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a beer if you can spot the serious bug in here. Um, and I don't mean that, I just... 
that's not. That's just a typo. I mean, there's a fundamental. <laughs> I'll give you the beer, but that's not what I meant. <laughs> um, anyway, the, the real implementation of this in, uh, in Perl itself is actually a lot more complicated than this. This is one of those uh, highly optimized pieces of code that um, the, act, the part that's actually doing the I.O. is about 150 lines of C. It contains six go-tos going to four labels. You can imagine my opinion on this part of the code, I hope. On the other hand, it works, because doing this is about 100 times as fast as the thing I've previously shown you. It's effective, but very, very ugly. Um, so yeah, basic buffering is implemented by a layer that for some reason is called Perl IO, because calling it buffering would have been too confusing. Um, and it's really, really a boring layer. The only thing it does is adding, add, add some buffering. It, it should be invisible for all other purposes. Um, unlike the next layer, which is CRLF. CR, as, you, as you probably know, um, on Windows, they have this weird idea that line endings are not a new line, but a carriage return new line. Why is that? Because DOS did that. Why is that? Because CPM did that. Why did CPM did that? Because it was working with physical printing terminals. <laughs> Hysterical reasons. Um, so yes, um, as an optimization is actually like the Windows replacement for Perl I.O., which is one of those things that's, that's very, very confusing if you first hit it and like, where's my Perl I.O. layer on Windows, and why is this working differently than on, on Unix? Um, optimization. And of course, Scalar, which you may have used. Um, this is actually the last base layer. It's a base layer and a buffering layer in one. It's doing crazy, crazy magic in order to pretend the scalar is actually I.O. Um, very, very useful. Kind of ugly. Uh, occasionally a bit buggy. We're working on it. Um, and then, of course, now we're getting to the um, the layers that you're actually used to using. Because most of the previous layers you're using them underneath, but you're never explicitly enabling them because they're the default layers, and um, except for CRLF, which you can explicitly enable on, Un on Unix, but no one ever does that. Um, yes, the UTF-8 layer is absolutely crazy. What it does is it sets a flag that says, I promise you this data is UTF-8. And then it's interpreted as UTF-8 without validation. Um, I, this is about as bad as taking a binary scalar and just enabling the UTF-8 flag. This is not a good thing. Probably the most important thing in this presentation is to remember, do not use colon UTF-8 for untrusted input. It's fine for output, not for input. Um, yes, it's just a flag. It's not even implemented as a proper layer. It's just a flag that promises the Perl this is UTF-8. And the other way around, bytes does not, does little, usually does little more that, than, no, always does nothing more than disable that flag, which has other interesting issues I'll get back to later. And then there's encoding, which is the thing you should usually be using. Uh, encoding is using the encode uh, module to basically be able to convert almost any encoding you've ever heard of and more uh, to UTF-8, which is what Perl is using on the inside. Um, it's kind of slowish, but actually working, otherwise working okay, usually, except bugs. Like, ooh, I'm starting a thread, and then it's Eckfolds. Um, 
Um, however, this is, this is also where the whole, I mentioned at the start of my presentation, um, uh, damn you. <laughs> uh, Perl IO is a stack and a lot of those layers, um, for a lot of those layers, ordering doesn't really matter. But for example, for encoding it does, especially for encodings that are um, multi-byte. For example, CRLF and encoding uh, UTF-16 have this wonderful issue where if you put the order around, it will first do the CRLF translation and then decoding the UTF-8, which by now has been shifted a byte, is no longer synchronized and is complete and utter garbage. This can happen. Um, you, kind of ha you kind of have to know that the right incantation. I don't know why some Windows people do this anyway. I mean, CRLF is a stupid um, idea anyway, and then they're doing that in UTF-8, which doesn't even work on a printing terminal anyway. Um, but people are actually using this in production, and you have to know the correct incantation to produce this. If, um, also, there was a big, uh, there was a bug where it was in Perl, until Perl 14, 514, where it was actually impossible to set the right, uh, it was almost impossible to set the right mode after it had been opened. Fun. Um, which brings me to another issue. Like I said, uh, bytes turns off a flag. UTF uh, encoding is written to always output UTF-8. So if you have an encoding layer and then put, push, put a byte layer on it, encoding will uh, convert your input from whatever encoding to UTF-8 and then Perl will read it as Latin 1. The other way around is even worse. If you, then Perl will, will take your perfectly valid UTF-8, downgrade it to Latin 1, and then pass it on to encoding, which will interpret it as UTF-8 and try to convert that to whatever encoding you asked for. Um, this is a general pattern in Perl I.O. where it's doing exactly what you're asking it to do, but it in no way stops you from doing something that's completely wrong. Um, then there's, uh, then there's the pop layer, which does nothing more than pop off the, pop off the topmost layer. Um, this is rarely useful. Occasionally, in the previous men mentioned case, it can be useful if you really know, I want to get rid of like that encoding layer, but not some layer underneath it. I've never really used it, honestly. Um, but here you have to realize again, UTF-8 is not a real layer. If you're trying to pop off UTF-8 layer, then you're actually popping off the UTF-8 and the layer underneath it. Because why would we have a consistent model? Um, and then there's raw. Raw is like one of those layers that you probably also have all used. Um, raw is actually quite sensible, mostly. Um, what it does is on layers like in What it, what it does is uh, it, pops, it pops off most complicated layers like encoding, it disables UTF-8 flag, and depending on your OS, it may or may not pop off CRLF. Otherwise, it will disable it, the CRLF translation in the CRLF layer, which, will, which makes it identical to Perl IO, except that it's not Perl IO. Interesting design decisions have been made. Um, and then there's uh, use open. There's the use open pragma, and the Perl IO environmental variable. What use open does is it adds a layer to the default set of layers. What um, what Perl IO does is it replaces the topmost leaf default layer because consistency. Um, this is also making it very hard to use Perl IO in a useful way. Um, yes, okay. One of, one of the interesting things you have to realize about Perl IO is that it's very much an open-ended system. I mean, these layers I just described are like the layers that are supported in core, but you can add any layer you can, you poss you can possibly imagine, you can add it. Um, 
there's Vaya, which is basically a layer to implement layers in, in Perl. Um, an ugly hack, but it almost works. And there's, for example, a gzip layer, uh, which basically on the fly unzips and gzips data, which is very useful because, again, like encoding, you can completely hide it away from the rest of your application. That's just handling a file handle like it always did, except that now it's gzipped. Um, then there's like an HTTP layer, which is a hack that I wrote um, to open a file over HTTP and pretend it's a real file. This is a bit hacky. It is only reading, not writing. <laughs> To-do list. But it mostly works. Um, for, for example, in the future, what, I, what other possibilities that I can imagine would be like some encrypted layer or some SSL layer, and there are plenty of possibilities uh, left. Um, right, this is gonna be my last slide because I'm almost out of time. Um, yes, in the future, um, I have some plans for Perl.io, and the start of it is really making UTF-8 and bytes do something that's sensible and sane and not likely to be completely wrong. Um, the prototype for it is actually already on CPAN. It's just that some core, some things in core, it breaks some obscure configurations that we kind of not want to break. Um, but there's, it's, it's not unlikely that 522 will have a UTF-8 layer that's actually working as sensible as encoding, but like three times as fast. Uh, Yes, yeah, so TLDR, this is the sort of thing you want to use. Most other layers you want to stay away from. Um, I'm going to make this the end of the presentation. Any short questions? Are there any plans for Scalar.io to support encoding? Um, I, was, I should have expected that question from you. Um, from a model point of view, that is kind of tricky from, should you, I, what you could do is not so much in the scalar layer, but in the part where it's automatically opening a scalar, you, what you could do there is make it add UTF, uh, an encoding layer on top of that. That would be possible. I'm not sure if it's a good idea or not, but it could be done. Yeah, hi. Uh, what about the support for byte order marks? But for what? For those, you know, sometimes on Windows there's this couple of bytes at the beginning of UTF-8. Ah, uh, bombs. Yeah. Um, well, encoding already supports bombs at least on UTF-16 and UTF-32. Bombs on UTF-8 are an abomination that should die. UTF-8 does not have a byte order. It's just silliness. Yeah, that doesn't help the Windows people. Um, I know, they should just get a decent editor. <laughs> <laughs> I have to stop now. Thank you for your attention.